comfortable filling out a resume if Jesus asked you to do that, a resume for being his witness? Or would that make you uncomfortable? <coughs> would you not be very confident as you were filling out that resume? Today we're going to answer a question on the basis of God's word. And the question is, what makes me worthy? What makes me capable of being a witness for Jesus Christ? And we'll begin today with our opening hymn, which helps us to answer that question in 770, which we'll sing as an insert in our bulletin.
the many things that we let get in the way of responding to Christ's call to be his witness to others with genuine passion and committed action. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his call servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
But do you think the guy who fixed up this car fixed it up so he could just sit in his driveway? No. You think he fixed it up so he could drive it around? Yes. I think so too. Jesus has made you God's holy child, so you can be useful to Jesus. Can you be useful to Jesus? Yes. What can you do be for nice Jesus? To you can be nice to Jesus. You can show your thanks to him. You can show your love to him by doing what he says. Uh, can you show your love to others too? Yes. Yeah. How do you do that?
This is our second lesson. The verse of the day. Hallelujah, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Alleluia. Mm -hmm.
our second lesson is from Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, and you'll find it back on page 5 of the service folder. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I've got some bad news for you people who made New Year's resolutions. In about two weeks, only 20% of you who made New Year's resolutions and still be keeping them. Which kind of begs the question. If it's so hard for me to quit eating ice cream at 9 o'clock at night, if it's so hard for me to manage my time, if it's so hard for me to stick to a budget, and if it's so hard for me to not let work get in the way of time with my family or to eat better, or to get to the gym three days a week, how in the world are we going to do what Jesus calls us to do today when he says to all of us, follow me, leave everything behind you, be fishers of men. You know what it takes to keep a New Year's resolution, doesn't it? Change of heart. That's what makes keeping New Year's resolutions so hard. A lot of times, the truth is, our hearts aren't really in it. We're not fully committed to it. That's why we can't keep them. So if I'm going to ever budget my time the right way, if I'm ever going to eat better, I've got to have a change of heart. And if I'm ever going to follow Jesus and live as his witness, I need a change of heart. Now here's the interesting thing. Usually, I get a change of heart when something bad happens. It's really hard for me to get control of, of what I eat. Until maybe I go to the doctor and he tells me that the illness I have is a direct result of my not taking care of myself. The bad news all of a sudden makes me say, okay, I've got to really do something. I have a change of heart for that's not how it works when Jesus calls us to follow him and be his witnesses. It's not something bad that produces a change of heart. That finally motivates us. It's something good. It's something wonderful. It's the most wonder wonderful message in the world. It's the gospel, the very message we're called to proclaim. Because the gospel inspires me by telling me that God loved me so much he came to this world to die for me in my own salvation. And to do that for everybody. The gospel tells me my fate and the fate of the entire world has been changed from eternal misery and suffering I deserve for my sins to the last thing I deserve, eternal joy and glory in heaven. And we're going to see today that it's that good news of the gospel that changed the hearts of the people in that congregation in Antioch. It's what empowered them to follow Jesus. And it's the same thing that changes our hearts today so we can be his witnesses. And so in our lives, God's power can be displayed in what we're willing to leave behind for the sake of the gospel and in what we're willing to give up to share the gospel with others. I want to start with a quick uh, question, a little survey question here. Can you raise your hands if you were not born and raised in Lansing? Okay, now keep them up and look around you. Look at all the people who one way or another came to this town and came to this congregation. Okay, you your hands up. So the question is, you know, what brought you here? Was it a job? Did you follow a spouse who got a job here? Did you move here to be closer to family? Did you come here because uh, you went to school here and then you just ended up staying in the area? What about the congregation in Antioch? How do you think that congregation came to be populated by so many people outside of Antioch? The congregation in Antioch was about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And a lot of the members of that congregation came from Jerusalem originally. Now, why did they move 300 miles away? They didn't so much move to Antioch as they fled to Antioch. You remember the persecution that was sparked by the martyrdom of Stephen? Remember when that deacon in the church in Jerusalem, Stephen, was stoned? All of a sudden, now um, all of the enemies of the gospel wanted to snuff out the church. It caused a lot of Christians in Jerusalem to, to run for their lives. They left behind businesses and jobs and incomes and families and friends and everything familiar to get them as far away as possible. And that's what a lot of people in Antioch, or that's what the church in Antioch uh, 
experienced, a lot of people joined that church because they were fleeing persecution. The question is this, what, what made the gospel so important for them? That they were willing to be disconnected from family. That they were willing to leave businesses and jobs and incomes, all for the sake of the gospel. Because, you know, all they had to do was just say, okay, I don't believe that anymore. And everything would have been the same and they would have been saved. You know why? Because the gospel was the message of what God had been willing to leave behind for them. He left behind all the power and glory he had in heaven to come to this world and to humble himself to even die for them. To change their futures from eternal misery to eternal joy in heaven. So they gladly left behind all of those things for the gospel. And then there are certain individuals in that Antioch congregation. Let's look at what they left behind. Just two of them. Let's look at Menean. Menean was raised in the palace of King Herod. This was the King Herod who killed Jesus when he was a baby. So he grew up with all of the perks of life in a palace. He had all of the privileges that come with that. But at some point he walked away from that. And now we see that he's just a preacher of the gospel in Antioch. He probably could have been an influential advisor to Herod's son whom he grew up with, who was now the Tetrarch of Galilee, but instead he gave that up for the sake of the gospel. And then you've got Saul, who we later know as Paul. You know that uh, Saul was a rising star in the Pharisee sect. He was destined to be an influential religious leader, but he left all of that behind for the sake of the gospel. More important, he left behind his entire way of looking at life. You know, there was a time when he said, I am sure God looks at me and says, I'm so lucky to have you among my people. Saul, you are so devout, so good. But that all changed when Paul was led to a realization of who he really is. A worthless sinner who was actually fighting against his God and his Savior. When that realization hit him, then the gospel became everything to him. That God loved him and forgave him despite who he was. And it was the gospel that led him to leave behind everything he had valued in his simple pride before. Including that foolish, empty way of religious life. The gospel still has power like that. Power to change your hearts and minds. And it does change them. The gospel changes what we value, just like it changed what those people in that congregation of Antioch value. So in the gospel, you have power to leave behind those personal sinful tendencies that are so ingrained in you that you're tempted to say sometimes, you know what, this is just who I am and this is who I, I'll always be. The gospel gives you power to leave that behind. The gospel gives you power to surrender the excuses you and I want too often and breaks hold on to as justification for our disobedience. In the gospel, there's the power to give those up. In the gospel, we have the power when we're being pulled the wrong way by an ungodly culture to not just give in and be swept along and live like everybody else, but to live in a new way for the sake of the gospel. In the gospel, you have the power when you crave acceptance and you know you can have it if you just compromise what you believe to instead stand firm and leave behind whatever acceptance you can have for the sake of the gospel. So the next time you feel yourself being pulled in the wrong direction, that downward, backward pull of the world and your sinful flesh and the devil, and especially when you come to the sad conclusion that you haven't resisted as hard as you should, go back to the gospel. In the gospel, you're going to see that God loves you as much today as he always has, despite your sin. That you're just as clean and pure to him today as the day he washed you clean and pure in your baptism, through the water of your baptism and the blood of your Savior. Your heart is changed by the gospel. And when it's changed, just like those believers in Antioch, you have power to leave behind what stands in the way of the gospel. You have the power to treasure the gospel above everything else. 
And you also have a changed heart that shows God's power is at work in you this way, by what you're willing to give up to share the gospel with others. When you read the book of Acts, you really don't find out much at all about that congregation in Antioch. We don't know where they met. We don't know um, if they were good potlucks. We don't know if they had a great music ministry or if they had a youth ministry or if they had a good church softball team. Well, I guess actually we know they didn't have a church softball team because softball wasn't invented at that time. But the point is, we don't really know much about this church at all, except for one thing. Every time you read about the church in Antioch, the people there are sharing the gospel. It starts when they're forced to leave Jerusalem because of persecution. We're told that everywhere they went, they shared the gospel with fellow Jews. And then we're told some of them shared the gospel with non-Jews, with Greeks or Gentiles. That's something Jews just didn't do. They didn't associate with unclean Gentiles. But these new Christians at Jerusalem, they shared the gospel with anybody. And then we're told a little later that the church in Jerusalem, here's what's happening up in Antioch, that this church is preaching the gospel with great passion to Jews and Gentiles, and the Lord's blessing the ministry of the word. Then they send up Barnabas to check out what's going on. And Barnabas, when he gets there, we're told, sees the evidence of the grace of God. And he decides to call a guy named Saul, the former persecutor of the church, to come. And together, we're told those two men preach the word of God for a year. To large crowds of people. Again, this passion for proclaiming the gospel we see. But there's even more than that. Now when you read Acts 13, it's maybe a year or two later, and they've got five pastors in this congregation. It, it's still a really young congregation, but they've got five men preaching and teaching God's word. And there's even more. When the Holy Spirit lets the church know that Saul and Barnabas have been chosen by the Spirit, to leave Antioch and to go to other parts of the Roman Empire to share the gospel there with Gentiles and with Jews. The church doesn't complain. I think it's kind of obvious that Saul and Barnabas are probably the most gifted and dynamic of all of the pastors they have. But the church doesn't complain that they have to give up these two pastors. They gladly, supportively send them on their way to preach the gospel for them in places they can't go. Because here's another way that the gospel changes our hearts. It changes our hearts by making them willing to, to give up whatever we need to give up. If it means the gospel will be proclaimed to more people for their salvation too. These people, these Christians in Antioch, shared with the Savior's passion for souls and his desire to save them. The gospel has power like that in your heart too. Power to, to change your value system so that the most important thing to you is to share the gospel with as many people as possible. Can you imagine any Christian thinking like this? I am so grateful for what the gospel means to me and my salvation that for the rest of my life I'm going to keep it to myself. Can you imagine any Christian saying, I am so moved by the profound truth that on the cross Jesus was dying for the forgiveness of the entire world that I'm never going to even wonder about the people in my life if they know about Jesus or if they believe in Him or look for opportunities to make sure they do. I met a man at one time who I think probably was the most consumed with guilt person I've ever met in my life. And he admitted it pretty freely to me about how he had known for 20 years what he should do and could do and how he had done just the opposite and was this shameful, worthless failure. When I shared the gospel with him that God loved him anyway, and I always had, and that he had sent his son to forgive everything that was consuming him with guilt and shame, and that he was free and pure and clean in God's eyes through Jesus, he broke down sobbing, tears of relief, tears of joy. But when he composed himself, he asked me a question. Why didn't anybody ever tell me this? Because the message was so good that, that he couldn't imagine anybody knowing it and not telling everybody else. And that's exactly how you and I think with hearts changed by the gospel. What I have is too good to keep to myself. I've got to share it. 
But the problem is we have sinful natures. And our sinful natures are not changed by the gospel. So just be aware that your sinful nature is always going to be pulling you back to share the gospel only in ways that are safe, only in ways that are comfortable. While that new self in you will be willing to make sacrifices for the gospel. But you don't have to listen to your sinful nature. Because you have a heart in which your Savior lives, a heart changed by His grace. So when your church plans to canvas neighborhoods, and you can go, there's a football game on that afternoon, and it's a pretty big one, and your leaves be breaking, and that's not really your thing anyway. You don't have to listen to your sinful nature that tells you to do what's safe and easy. You can step out of your comfort zone. You can step out onto the sidewalk with fellow believers. And you can walk up to people's houses and simply invite them to come to the next big church service or event, whatever it is. You can do that to share the gospel. And when you're writing out that check, it not only makes a pretty clear statement of how much you love God and how much you love others, you don't have to listen to your sinful nature that always tells you not too much, but it's safe. You can listen to the voice of your Savior inside you, who is always going to remind you of how much he loves the world and what he did for them. And you can write an amount on that check that shows how much you really do love all of those people out there who are going to be reached either in our community or in the world through the gospel that you support. And when God unexpectedly opens a door in a conversation you're having, and you didn't think it was going to lead to this, but all of a sudden somebody's pouring out their troubles to you, and in an instant, you know they need the comfort of Jesus, and that's the best thing you can give them. You don't have to listen to that little voice inside you that says, now's not the time to do that, but I mean, I'm right in the middle of a supermarket. I'm at work, for goodness sake. I'm in the school hallway. I'm in the gym. You don't have to say this is the time or the place, but maybe, maybe someday I can, I can say something. And in that moment, you can see the opportunity, and thinking not of your comfort, but theirs. You can share the message of Jesus with because your heart's been changed. And that's evident in what you're willing to give up, to sacrifice, to do, to share that message of the gospel with others. You're not going to be moved to do that by being reminded that's what you should do. But rather by being reminded you're forgiven for all the times you haven't done that. Just like you're forgiven for all of your other sins in Christ. And in that gospel, your Savior will continue mold and shape your heart like his, changing it so that you are willing in your life to leave behind whatever needs to be left behind for the sake of the gospel, and to give up whatever needs to be given up to proclaim it to as many people as possible, all for his glory. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please join with me as we now confess our faith in the words on page 8. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, he hath not made but one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
while when we see in the gospel what your son was willing to give up for us and our salvation, and the salvation of the world, may these offerings today show our love for you and our thanks to you for such great grace and mercy. And may it also show what we are willing to sacrifice to share that saving message with others. We ask this for your glory and for their eternal good. Amen. It's our privilege today to welcome into our church family a number of new members, so I would ask the McClellan and also Gail Bennett to come forward at this time. And you can come right up onto the altar platform. Dear members of Shepherd of the Hills, these fellow believers have been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God and desire to become members of this congregation, brothers and sisters in Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before His Father in Heaven, those who faithfully confess Him on earth. You have come before this Christian congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your heart to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, then answer, I do. Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, then answer, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, be diligent in the use of God's Word and sacraments, lead a godly life even to death? If so, then answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? If so, then answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. Having heard your promises, we, the members of Shepherd of the Hills Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love, and invite you to share in our worship and mission in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Robert McClellan, John McClellan, Audrey McClellan, and Gail Bennett. Brothers and sisters, please stand and we will join in prayer. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, in mercy you have joined these brothers and this sister to your church, for they were born again of water and the Spirit. In mercy you taught them your saving truth. Grant that they and all of us may offer ourselves as living sacrifices to you as our spiritual act of worship. Transform us by the renewing of our minds, so that we do not conform to the pattern of this world. Help us live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Please remain standing as we join now in the prayer of the church from our service folder. We continue on page nine. Eternal God and Father, we give you thanks for the blessings we share as members of your holy church, for your gracious word and sacraments, for opportunities to worship and to grow in faith and knowledge, for occasions to serve and be served, for fellowship with believers in our congregation and in our synod. Help us to rejoice in these blessings, dear Lord, and to use them faithfully. Jesus Christ, Lord of the church, you give grace to your people by calling us to be your witnesses in the world. Open our eyes to see the great and noble mission that lies before us, in the hurting eyes of the lonely, in the pained eyes of the sick, and in the searching eyes of the lost. Help us to see your face, O oh Jesus, and to serve others as we would serve you. Awaken us to the opportunities you give to proclaim your message of love. Holy Spirit, giver of life, through word and sacrament, bestow on us the wisdom and power we need to witness clearly and to act boldly. Help us to speak the truth in love, to give the reason for the hope we have, and to conduct ourselves with gentleness and respect. Set our hearts on fire as we work and witness for Christ. Hear us, Lord, as we now pray for a family member, an acquaintance, a neighbor, or a friend who does not believe in you, or whose faith is weak or troubled.
Bless the church with men and women who are willing to proclaim your word in places where we cannot go. Keep them and their loved ones in your care and let nothing hinder their work. By the power of the gospel, restore their spirits each day so that they do not lose heart as they serve us and others. Move us to support them with our sincere prayers and generous offerings. And we also pray today, Heavenly Father, for the needs of those we love who are ill or hospitalized, recovering from surgery, or in any way troubled or grieving, including Karen Berry and Sue Spencer, who are recovering from surgery, Roy Lumbert, the grandfather of Jack Lumbert, who has cancer and is soon undergoing surgery, Margaret Kinney, who has been hospitalized and who is now recovering in a rehab facility, Sue Davis, Kate Preston, and Janet, uh, Janet Odell, who are experiencing ill health or injury. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would grant them comfort in Jesus, their Savior, and the assurance that he is with them and will work through all things, even their difficulties, for our spiritual and eternal good. Give them confidence that their Savior lives to bring them through everything we experience in this life and all of our hardships to finally bring us to glory in heaven. Wherever your word is proclaimed, O Lord, grant it success. Let your kingdom come to us and to others, so that we and many more might join the assembly of saints and angels to sing your praise forever. Savior of all, hear our prayer, and help us in our mission. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God has appeared in the flesh, coming to reveal his love to us and to rescue us from our sins. He knows that you and I need the comfort of his love and forgiveness all our lives, for we daily struggle with temptations and troubles and trials. We often stumble and sin. So God the Son comes to us now in the flesh in his supper, giving us the mercy, forgiveness, comfort, peace, and strength we seek from him. Arise and shine, for your light comes to you.
Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
John, Audrey, and Robert McClellan, and also Kale Bennett. Um, I ask the McClellans and Kale to stand with me at the back, uh, just so you can be greeted by all of your uh, fellow members of your church family. And we're very, very happy and thankful to God you're part of our church family. I want to thank the people who helped with our lock-in this last Friday night, especially the people who stayed up all night. Uh, that was amazing and beyond me. So, uh, thankfully, we have a stay-up-all-night new pastor and Pastor Tulber. Um, but thank you, everybody who brought stuff and everybody who helped with that. The kids had a great time. Big turnout, I guess somewhere around 20 to 25 kids. Really great. Uh, finally, just a couple more things. I'll, make, I'll be making a decision on my call probably early this, this coming week, so I wanted to thank all of you for input and for prayers. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, both myself and, and Betsy and our family. Uh, then I'd finally like to mention that uh, you may be curious what's going on from the left side of my face. It kind of looks like I was hit by buckshot there. It's a skin cancer treatment. It's really not a big deal, but um, that way you don't have